Hi, hello, and welcome to the Word. We saw in one of our studies that John the Baptist, who identified Jesus, pointed him out to the crowd and baptized him under pressure, eventually doubted his messiahship and asked his disciples to ask him whether he was truly the messiah. A gentleman called Dudley M. Kenwright was a very staunch Seventh-day Adventist, working in every aspect of the denomination. He oversaw the work at the highest level, but something was wrong. Something went wrong. He eventually left the church to work for another denomination. What went wrong? How could this be? How could you spend your most vibrant years building something, then walk away from it? Ready to find out? Let's get started. Our focus today, as you can tell, is not a biblical study, but a religious historical one. Many of you have no clue who Canwright is, some a vague idea. Therefore, the information presented is totally new for some and a refresher for the other. Well, that is where learning takes place. You can't pretend to know when you don't know. I want to share this for a particular reason. Of course, you may choose not to continue if that's not what you wish to look at at this time. However, at your convenience, it would be nice to take a look. I'm aware it's not a biblical study, as I said. Treat this as a snippet of an audiobook. From time to time, these things are necessary for knowledge. Do we know about Canwright's change of heart during the life of Ellen and James White? Some interesting stuff to unearth here. But before we get there, let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we approach your throne of grace asking you for mercy and pardon and healing. We claim your marvelous name as the angels declare holy, holy, holy. We ask that you pour upon us a fresh anointing and lead us into paths of righteousness. Bless us this very moment, we pray, and teach us to be kind and compassionate, for we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. You may ask, so where are we going with this, Pastor? Every now and then, an historical input is necessary to show that nothing is new. People come and go all the time. My aim is to impart some historical knowledge that otherwise you would not have known or researched. The obvious question would be, who is Dudley Canwright and why is he getting airplay here? Canwright was a dedicated Seventh-day Adventist leader who left the church and wrote about it. Now, the reason why I find it noteworthy is because he had personal encounters with James and Ellen White and all the early leaders and changed his mind on things he participated in wholeheartedly. Was he lost when he walked away? Did he become hopeless? When Jesus was calling followers, he said this in Luke 9 and verse 62. Anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Would that refer to Canwright? Because I always like to quote from original sources and not from a third party, I will let him speak for himself from his book, Seventh-day Adventism Renounced, by D. M. Canwright, 1914. Listen to his opening statement. To criticize, expose, and condemn others is not a pleasant task. But when religious teachers enthrone error and mislead honest people, silence would be unkind and censurable. This is a powerful quote. He continues, Being profoundly convinced that Seventh-day Adventism is a system of error, I feel it my duty to publish what I know of it. I do it in the fear of God, knowing the sorrow it has brought to my heart and to thousands. I must warn others against it. I do not question the honesty of Adventists, but the sincerity does not sanctify the errors. I have had to speak plainly, but I trust kindly. I have had to treat each subject briefly and leave many untouched, but I have taken up the main pillars of the faith. If these fall, the whole must go down. So be sure to understand that he is saying he does not hate the members, but his duty was based on the doctrines of the church. That is a serious accusation to make. He continues, 
It is now nearly 25 years since this book was first published. This is the 14th edition. It has been translated into several languages, sold by numerous publishing houses, gone to the ends of the earth, wherever Adventism has gone, and has been the greatest obstacle that work has ever had to meet. Yet, Adventists have ventured no answer to it. Say what they may, it is evident that they would gladly answer if they could do so safely. So Canwright is shooting straight at the hips. He is stating that this book has been out for 14 years and no one has dared to respond to it. So this is a serious indictment here. Now, no one living on this planet was born or living now was born when this was written. So nothing here refers to anyone directly today. But the more things change, the more they remain the same. Considering that Adventists are always so ready for debate, discussion, and replies, how is it that this book that has bothered them more than all others which have appeared against them is so carefully let alone by them? The reason is manifest to all candid people. You hear this? Adventists at that time were always ready for debate and discussion and responses, but yet years had passed and no one responded to his accusations in his book. He's not referring to little jabs made in papers. So one of the best tactics you can use when you have no answer to something is to say, I don't get caught up in this back and forth debates or just keep silent, hoping that others will see your silence as an answer. Canwright shows that he was a well-respected Seventh-day Adventist. And here is what my Advent brethren thought of me before I left them. Battle Creek, Michigan, July 13, 1881. Brother Canwright, I feel more interest in you than in any other man because I know your worth when the Lord is with you as a laborer. James White. Battle Creek, Michigan, May 22, 1881. It is time there was a change of the officers of the General Conference. I trust that if we are true and faithful, the Lord will be pleased that we should constitute two of that board. James White. When he left, the Review and Herald reported, Adventist Review, March 1887, we have felt exceedingly sad to part in our religious connection with one whom we have long esteemed as a dear brother. Advent Review, March 22, 1887. In leaving us, he has taken a much more manly and commendable course than most of those who have withdrawn from us, coming voluntary to our leading brethren and frankly stating the condition of mind he was in. He did this before his own church, in our presence, and so far as we know, has taken no unfair, underhanded means to injure us in any way. He goes from our midst with no immoral stain upon his character, chooses associations more pleasant to himself. This is every man's personal privilege if he chooses to take it. The quotations in my book are from the Adventist books published up to the date when I wrote my book, 1889. So as we see here, even when he was leaving it, it was said that he was a gentleman. He withdrew cordially with no unfair, underhanded means to injure us in any way, they said. Now, this is important to note because this is not what will be said later by others who would speak their lies until it becomes the narrative. This reminds me of when Pastor Courtney Francois of the South Caribbean Conference of SD left the church in Trinidad. I have never heard someone apologize so much for a decision taken. He stated how he did not want to confuse the church. He could say nothing negative about the leaders, but he was leaving based on conviction. Now, with that noble move, you expect to get a response like what you just heard with Canwright. But it does not matter how many years apart they are, the result of the brethren would be the same. You touch my church and I will tear you down. It's not about analyzing information and making informed decisions, but it is about if you turn away from this, I will cut you down. This is your only ticket to salvation. How dare you speak against it? How dare you help the enemies to fight against the only means of salvation? He said, I design to be perfectly fair towards my Advent brethren. I was with them 28 years, from the age of 19 to 47. 
the most active years of my life. I was dearly loved by them and I loved them. I love them now. I have thousands of dear friends among them still. It was a terrible trial to break away from all these tender ties. Even now the tears fall fast as I write these lines. But truth and duty were dearer to me than social ties. Again, I bear them record that they are a sincere, devoted, self-sacrificing people, thoroughly believing what they profess. They have many excellent qualities and many lovely Christian people among them. Like all churches, they have their full share of undesirable members, not from any immoral teachings, but from human frailty common in all churches. Daily I pray for them that the Lord may bless all that is good in them and forgive and in some way overrule for good when they are in error. This is all I dare ask for myself. D.M. Canwright, 1914. Again, a very noble preface to his 1914 edition. Remember, the book was published in 1889. No bitterness, no condemnations, but only on the level of what he finds as truth and error. And as they themselves said, he was fair and stated on what grounds he left. My present standing. When a prominent man leaves one church or party and joins an opposing one and gives his reasons for it, he may expect that his old associates will reply to him. I expected no exception in my case when I renounced Adventism, so I have not been disappointed. The great majority of my former brethren have been very friendly to me and treated me kindly. A few, a very few, have done otherwise. Their object has been to counteract my influence against what they regard as God's work. These few have started the report that I have been sorry I left Adventism, that I have said so, have tried to return to them, have confessed that my book was false, and some have said that I was very poor, uh, physical and mental wreck, with no hope of salvation, etc. These reports are associated as facts by honest brethren and reported till they are believed by many Adventists the world over. I have denied them in every possible way, but they are still believed and repeated, and doubtless always will be. I leave God to judge between us. So be careful with the stories you hear about Canwright. He is here telling you what is circulated about him and will continue to be believed. Who do you believe, the person himself or the stories from third parties? You will believe the stories that makes you, you will believe the stories that make you feel justified. He continues, I now and here for the hundredth time solemnly affirm before God that I renounced Adventism because I believe it to be an error. I have never once regretted that I did so. I have never intimated to anyone that I have had the least desire to go back to that people. It would be impossible for me to do such a thing and be an honest man. I am now well in body and mind, have a good home worth $10,000 or $12,000, and have four grown children of whom any man would be proud. On leaving the Adventist, I joined the Baptist Church at Otsego, Michigan, and became its pastor, till it was built up into a prosperous church. They honor me as their father, consult me on all important matters, and hotly resent the foolish reports which some circulate concerning me. Adventists sometimes say I left them for four or five times. I withdraw from that church just once. No more. That was final. Their church records at Battle Creek and Ostego will show that. For years I was troubled with doubts about some of their doctrines and three times stopped preaching for a period but remained a member in good standing. At a large camp meeting, I was persuaded to swallow my doubts, take up the work again, confess that I had been in the dark, and go on again. I yielded judgment to the entreaties of my brethren and the love I had for old associates, and said what I soon regretted. I found it a terrible struggle to break away from what had held me so long. Since I left them, they tried to make it appear that I did not amount to much anyway. Sour grapes, said the fox to the delicious fruit which he could not reach. 
During two years, 1876 and 1877, I was one of the General Conference Committee of three which had control of all their work in the world. There is no high authority in the denomination. How did it happen that I was placed in that office if I was not one of their best men? Year after year, I was elected on the boards having charge of their most important institutions such as the publishing houses, college, sanitarium, Sabbath school association, etc. But it was as a writer in their papers, as the author of numerous tracts, pamphlets, and books covering nearly every controverted point of their faith, as a lecturer and debater in defense of the doctrines that I was the best known during the last 15 years I was with them. In these lines, not a man among them stood as prominent as I did. Everyone at all familiar with the work during that period knows that I tell only the simple truth in the case. My long and thorough acquaintance with Adventism and all the arguments prepared me to answer them as no other could. Hundreds of ministers from all parts have written me their thanks for the aid my book has been to them in meeting Adventism. Did not God in his providence prepare me for this work? I humbly believe he did, and this reconciles me to the long and bitter experiences I had in that bondage. But if God and the truth is honored, I am content. I love those brethren still, and know that most of them are honest Christian people, but in error on many of their views. I would be glad to help them if I could. D.M. Canwright, Pastor Emeritus of the Berean Baptist Church, Grand Rapids, Michigan. He stated a few things in his chapters. Chapter 1, Doctrines and Methods of Seventh-day Adventists. Their doctrines. In doctrine, they differ radically from evangelical churches. They hold to the materiality of all things, believe in the sonship of Christ, believe that they only have a correct understanding of the prophecies to which they give most of the attention, that the end of the world is to occur in this generation, that we are now in the judgment which began in 1844, that Seventh-day Adventists, that Seventh-day Saturday must be kept, that keeping Sunday is the mark of the beast, that all should pay tithes, that Mrs. White is inspired as were the writers of the Bible, that the Bible must be interpreted to harmonize with her writings, that they are called of God to give the last warning to the world, that the dead are unconscious, that the wicked and the devil will be annihilated, that all churches but their own are Babylon and rejected of God, that everybody but themselves will soon become spiritualists, that when Christ comes, only 144,000 out of all of them, then living on the earth, all of them living on the earth will be saved, and all these will be Seventh-day Adventists. Hence, they have no fellowship with other Christians, never work with them in any way, but zealously proselyte from all. They believe in the Bible, in conversion, in purity of life, in rigid temperance, in strict morality, and in other good things common to all churches. Their hostility to all other churches. One of the highly objectionable features of that system is the bitter hostility of its believers towards all other churches. Their theory is that all churches but their own were utterly rejected of God in 1844 for not embracing Miller's doctrine. Thus, Mrs. White says, I saw the state of the different churches since the second angel proclaimed their fall in 1844. They have been growing more and more corrupt. Satan has taken full possession of the churches as a body. The churches were left as were the Jews, and they have been filling up with every unclean and hateful bird. I saw great iniquity and vileness in their churches, yet they profess to be Christians. Their professions, their prayers, and their exhortations are an abomination in the sight of God. Under religious guise, Satan will spread his influence over the land. He hopes to deceive many by leading them to think that God is still with the churches. On this, the Review and Herald, May 3, 1887 says, We are aware that to assume that this revival work, so unquestionably accepted by all the churches, is not genuine, will cause the hands of Christendom to be raised in holy horror. If he, God, is with us, he has not been with the popular churches in any marked manner since they rejected the Advent message of 1843 and 44. 
and they are congratulating themselves over delusive appearances and a prosperity which has no existence in fact. The hand of God cannot direct two movements so antagonistic in nature. Who is deceived? Seventh-day Adventists dwell much on how easy it is to be deceived, to be led by Satan, when we think it is the Lord, to believe a lie for the truth. It is amusing to see how innocently they apply this to all others and never dream that it has any application to themselves. What? They deceived? They misled? Impossible. They know they are right. Exactly. And that is just the way all feel, whether they be Mormons, Shakers, Catholics, or whatnot. The Adventists themselves are an illustration of the ease with which people are misled. I long hesitated about bringing personal matters into this book, but could see no way to tell my story without it. I was born in Kinderhook, Branch County, Michigan, September 22, 1840. I had no religious training till I was 16. I was converted among the Methodists under the, the labors of Reverend M. Hazard and baptized by him in 1858. I soon went to Albion, New York to attend school here. In 1859, I heard Elder and Mrs. White. He preached on the Sabbath question. I was uneducated and knew but little about the Bible. I had no idea of the relation between the Old and New Testaments, the law and the gospel, or the difference between the Sabbath and the Lord's Day. I thought he proved that the seventh day was still binding and that there was no authority for keeping Sunday. As I was anxious to be right, I began keeping Saturday, but did not expect to believe any more of their doctrine. Of course, I attended their meetings on Saturday and worked on Sunday. This separated me entirely from other Christians and threw me wholly with the Adventists. I soon learned from them that all other churches were Babylon, in the dark and under the frown of God. Seven day Adventists were the only true people of God. They had the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. They defended Mr. Miller's work of 1844, believed in the visions of Mrs. White, the sleep of the dead, the annihilation of the wicked, feet washing, etc. At first, these things staggered me and I thought of drawing back but they explained them plausibly and smoothed them over and said there were no tests anyway. Having no one to intelligently aid me, I began to see things as they did and in a few weeks came to believe the whole system. I was again baptized as their converts from other churches generally are, so as to keep clean out of Babylon. Persuaded that time was short, I gave up going to school, dropped the study of all else listened to their preaching, devoured their books, and studied my Bible day and night to sustain these new views. I was now an enthusiastic believer and longed to convert everybody to the faith. I had not a doubt that it was the pure truth. This is about the experience of all who go with them, as I have since learned. In May 1864, I was licensed to preach, soon began with Elder Van Horn at Ithaca, Michigan. We had good success. Raised up three companies that year in 1865, worked in Tuscola County and had excellent success. Was ordained by Elder White that year. Up to this date, I had not a doubt about the truthfulness of our faith, as I now began to see more of Elder White and wife and the work at headquarters. I learned that there was much trouble with him. I saw that he ruled everything and that all greatly feared him. I saw that he was often cross and unreasonable. This troubled me a little, but not seriously. In 1866, I was sent to Maine with Elder J. N. Andrews, the, the ablest man among them. This was a big thing for me. I threw myself into the work with great enthusiasm and was very happy. Elder Andrews was strong in the faith and very radical, and I partook of his spirit. We had excellent success. By this time, I had become quite a writer. I returned to Battle Creek in 1867. At that time, there was a great trouble with Elder White and many church meetings were held to investigate the matter. It was clear to me that he was wrong, but Mrs. White sustained him in her testimonies, quotations, and severely blamed the church. Elder Andrews and a few others proposed to stand up for the right and take the consequences. My sympathies were with them but others feared and finally all wilted and confessed that we have been blinded by Satan. This was signed 
by the leading ministers and humbly adopted by the whole church. You can see Testimonies, Volume 1, page 612. This shook my faith a good deal, and I began to question Mrs. White's inspiration. I saw that her revelations always favored Elder White and herself. If any did question their course, they soon received a scathing revelation denouncing the wrath of God against them. In 1868, I went to Massachusetts. Being away from the, the trouble at headquarters, I got on finding. But in May 1869, I was in Battle Creek for a month. Things were in bad shape. Elder White was in trouble with most of the leading men, and they with him. I was well convinced that he was the real cause of it all. But Mrs. White sustained him, and that settled it. They were God's chosen leaders and must not be criticized or meddled with. I felt sad. I was working hard to get men into the truth, as we call it to persuade them that this was a people free from the faults of other churches. Then to see such a state of things among the leaders disheartened me greatly. So far, I myself had no trouble with anyone, and Elder White had been very cordial to me. But I saw then that if I ever come to be of any prominence in the work, I should have to expect the same treatment from him that all of the others got. The more I saw of the work, the more objections I saw to it. I will not stop to give them here, as I will give them together in chapter 5. I had been so thoroughly drilled in the Adventist doctrines that I firmly believed the Bible taught them all. To give up the Advent faith was to give up the Bible. So all my brethren said, and so I thought. Wherever Elder White and wife went, they were always in trouble with the brethren, and the best ones too. I came to dread to meet them, or have them come where I was, for I knew there would be trouble with someone or something, and it never failed of so being. I saw church after church split up by them, the best brethren discouraged and maddened and driven off, while I was compelled to apologize for them continually. For years about this time, the main business at all or big meetings was to listen to the complaints of Elder White against his brethren. Not a leading man escaped, Andrews, Wagner, Smith, Love Borrow, Amadan, Cornell, Aldrich, Walker, and a host of others had to take their turn at being broken on the wheel. For hours at a time, and times without number, I have sat in meetings and heard Elder White and wife denounce these men, till I felt there was little manhood left in them. It violated all my ideas of right and justice and stirred my indignation. Yet whatever vote was asked, by Elder White, we all voted it unanimously, I with the rest. Then I would go out alone and hate myself for my cowardice and despise my brethren for their weaknesses. Elder Mrs. White ran and ruled everything with an iron hand. Not a nomination to office, not a resolution, not an item of business was ever acted upon in business meetings until all had been first submitted to Elder White for his approval. Till years later, we never saw an opposition vote on any question, for no one dared to do it. Hence, all official voting was only a farce. The will of Elder White settled everything. If anyone dared to oppose anything, however humbly, Elder White, a wife, quickly squelched him. Long years of such training taught people to let their leaders think for them. Hence, they are under as complete subjection as are the Catholics. These with other things threw me into the doubt and discouragement and tempted me to quit the work. I saw many an able minister and scores of valuable men leave us because they would not stand such treatment. In 1872, I went to Minnesota where I had good success. By this time, I had written much and so was well known to all our people. In July 1873, myself and wife went to Colorado to spend a few weeks with Elder White and wife in the mountains. I soon found things very unpleasant living in the family. Now my turn had come to catch it, but instead of knuckling down, as most of the others had, I told the elder my mind freely. That brought us into open rupture. Mrs. White heard it all, but said nothing. In a few days, she had a long written testimony for wife and me. It justified her husband in everything and placed us as rebels against God, with no hope of heaven, only by a full surrender to them. 
Wife and I read it over many times with tears and prayers, but could see no way to reconcile it with truth. It contained many statements which we knew were false. We saw that it was dictated by a spirit of retaliation, a determination to break our wills or crush us. For a while we were in great perplexity, but still my confidence in much of the doctrine and my fear of going wrong held me. But I was perfectly miserable for weeks, not knowing what to do. However, I preached a while in Colorado and then went to California where I worked with my hands for three months trying to settle what to do. Elders Butler, Smith, White and others wrote to us and tried to reconcile us to the work. Not knowing what else to do, I finally decided to forget all my objections and go along as before. So we confessed to Elder White all we could possibly, all we could possibly, and he generously, generously forgave us. But from that on, my faith in the inspiration of Mrs. White was weak. Elder White was very friendly to me again after that. Now the Adventists say that I have left them five times and this is one of the five. It is utterly untrue. I simply stopped preaching for a few weeks, but did not withdraw from the church nor renounce the faith. If this is leaving them, then most of the leading men have left them too. For they all have, for they all have had their periods of trial when they left their work a while. About 1856 elders Jane Andrews and Jane Loughborough, who were then the most prominent ministers among them, and several other persons left the work and went into business at Walken, Iowa. Mrs. White gave an account of this in Experience and Views, pages 219 to 222. Elder White and wife went there and after a long effort brought them back. Mrs. White says, a dissatisfied party had settled in and woken. Um, Brother Jane Loughborough, in discouragement, had gone to work at his trade. He was just about to purchase land, etc. Page 20, 222. These men did just what I did. He wrote to me that he had to endorse Mrs. White's visions out of policy. The thing is so unreasonable that most of them at times are more or less troubled over it, just as I was. In the language of J.W. Morton, and I quote, I pity their delusions and abominate their spiritual tyranny by which they and others are held to the most unscriptural dogmas. Even Mrs. Smith, for whom, however, he may denounce me, I entertain only the most kindly feelings, is in a position that calls for tender commensuration. He is expected as the great man of the denomination, for he undoubtedly is by far the ablest man they have to give a full and explicit endorsement of Mrs. White's claims of inspiration. And yet, whoever scans his public utterances on this point, especially he who has skill to read between the lines, can see that his endorsement is so feeble as to be no endorsement at all. In the fall of 1880, I resolved to leave the Adventists, and if I could go with some other church, I was president of the Ohio Conference, our annual state meeting was at Clyde, Ohio. Elder and Mrs. White were there. My mind was made up to leave them as soon as the meeting was over. Against my protest, they re-elected me president. Mrs. White urged it, said I was just the man for the place. Yet her special claim is to be able to reveal the hidden wrongs in the church. Here was an important matter. Why did she not have a revelation about it? No. I was all right so far as she knew. The next week I resigned, went east, and wrote Elder White that I would go with them no longer. Then she sent me a long written revelation denouncing me as a child of hell and one of the wickedest of men. Though only two weeks before, she thought me fit to be president of a conference. Have mercy. For three months I taught elocution. I knew not what to do. I talked with ministers of other churches, but they did not seem to know how to help me. I could settle on nothing. I held on to my Christianity and love for Christ and the Bible and preached and worked as I had opportunity. I was glad I had decided to leave the Adventists and felt much better. Finally, I met my present wife who was an Adventist. Then I had a long talk with Elder Butler, Elder White, Mrs. White and others and was persuaded that things were not as I had imagined. They said I was in the dark, led by Satan, and would go to ruin 
all the influence of old friends, associations, habits, and long cultivated ideas came up and were too strong for my better judgment. I yielded and resolved again to live and die with them. The death of Elder White. I could give much more to show how little confidence the leading men had in each other. I wrote Elder White that I could not unite with him nor work with him. July 13, 1881, he wrote me again, I quote, I have repeatedly abused you and if you'd go to destruction where many, to say the least, are willing you should go, I should ever feel that I had taken a part in your destruction. I do not see how any man can labor with me. End of quote. Soon after this he died. I have no doubt that Elder White believed in the Advent doctrine and persuaded himself that he was called of God to be a leader. He had some excellent qualities and doubtless meant to be a Christian, but his strong desire to rule and run everything together with an irritable temper kept him always in trouble with someone. Why did I not leave them sooner? I am often asked why I did not leave them sooner. Why it took me so long to find that it was in an error? Then the Adventists affirm that I must have been dishonest while with them, or I am dishonest now. They say I am an apostate now because I left them and joined the Baptists. My answer is this. If to change one's opinion and join another church makes one an apostate, then more than half their members are apostates, for they have come from other churches to join the Adventists. Again, they circulate and commend highly a book called 50 Years in Rome, written by a man who was many years a learned priest in the Roman church. They say that his high standing and long experience in that church makes his book invaluable. But they say that the fact that I was with them in high standing so long and now I've left them only proves that I am a hypocrite. Again, it was only during the last few years that I gained possession of early Adventist documents, which show how they now deny and contradict what they once thought. These are now either suppressed or kept out of sight so that not one in a thousand of them knows or will believe that they ever existed. My doubts of the system did not come to me all at once and clearly it was well known that for the last dozen years I was with them, I was greatly troubled over these things. Gradually, year by year, the evidence accumulated till at last it overbalanced the doctrine and then reluctantly and sorrowfully I had to abandon and renounce it. God pity the soul that has to go through what I did to be honest to his conviction of right. So here you have that snippet. More than a hundred years ago, I will not make any comments. Just thought I would make some of this available to someone who is struggling with things that they do not agree with or things that do not agree with the Bible to someone who cannot interpret the Bible without Ellen White. Some people believe that God did not put everything in scripture, but he gave the rest to Ellen White. I am not advocating that you leave your church. I'm not doing that at all. Don't accuse me of that and to join another church. I am asking you to find your way closer to Jesus and stop thinking that your salvation is linked to a church. It is all about Jesus. Let us pray. Thank you, Lord, for life and the ability to reason and understand. Be with someone today who is trying to be obedient to your word, but is locked into what they are taught and not what is actually written. Release someone from the mental bondage equivalent to that of slavery and break those chains of denominationalism and restore, restore pure faith in Jesus alone. Bless us now, we pray. For we ask it in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thanks again for watching. If you have been blessed, feel free to like, to share, and to subscribe if you have not yet done so. And as you do, may you rest in the wise, objective, resourceful, and definitive word of God. Amen.